history of child language acquisition goes back to the 50s. Um, There's a famous debate between um, Skinner, who had a kind of behaviourist account of, of how children learn language, which was then famously um, challenged by uh, Chomsky, who argued that um, you can't learn language just by listening to the language that you hear. There must be some kind of system already in your head, which is kind of processing that language in a, 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 that comes in in a specific way to allow you to build a grammar from the kind of very small and fragmentary amounts of language that you hear. And in one way or another, this debate between um, Chomsky or, or Chomsky and supporters who think that you have to have some innate knowledge of language, some language that you're born with, and various opponents who think that language can indeed be learned just from what you hear, um, that debate has, has never really gone away and has, has continued um, right up until the present day. So the Chomsky idea is that children are born with some knowledge of language already in their heads. So obviously that knowledge has to be very abstract because the um, innate knowledge doesn't know what language the child is going to be born speaking. So obviously it would be useless to be born with individual words of English or Russian or, or whatever because obviously it would be no use if you were learning the wrong language. So it has to be very abstract. So the idea, for example, is that children are born with say, grammatical categories, like empty boxes. So they're born knowing that languages contain nouns and verbs and all they have to do is hear the language around them and once they recognise words that they hear as a noun or a verb, say, then they can put them in the right box, as it were. And this helps the child because they're born not just with the boxes, but with rules for combining these boxes or these categories into sentences. So one rule that a child is born with, um, for example, is that you can combine a noun and a, a verb um, to simplify somewhat, to make a very simple sentence. So like, um, you know, John ran or Bill danced. Is a, so the idea is that you don't even need to learn to do that. You're born with the categories and the rules for combining them into sentences. You have to learn which order they come in in your particular language, but the idea that you can combine a noun phrase and a verb phrase in that way, the idea under Chomsky's approach is, is that you don't have to learn that, you're born with it. So the other approach says that you're not born with this um, knowledge of language. Everything that you know about language is just um, built from the language that you hear all around you. It's difficult to, to tell between them because obviously we can't look directly in children's heads and, uh, and, and, and see what's there. So the way I've, I try to answer this question is by running experiments with um, children. So I'll just talk about one example of where the two approaches make different predictions. So questions in English, when children ask questions, this is uh, an area that's been studied quite a lot because children make quite a few errors with questions. So an English question should be something like, um, what do you like or what can she eat? But English speaking children often make mistakes where they say things like what she can eat or what you do like. So a way to compare between the two approaches is to see if there's any patterning to these errors. So according to the Chomsky approach, these questions are formed by one of these rules that I mentioned earlier, these rules that you're born with. So if you can make a question with one WH word on one person, say, then you should be able to do it for every everyone. You shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be showing different performance for different ones. Whereas the other approach, the, um, the constructivist approach, says that you learn language from what you hear around you. So this predicts that children might be very good at asking a question like, what are you doing, that they've heard an awful lot, or, uh, or any question like, what is thing process. Whereas a question that they haven't asked very much, like, I don't know, why isn't he doing something, or um, why don't they do this? They'll be much worse with those types of questions. So the Chomsky approach predicts equal performance with all the different types of questions. The anti chomsky approach or the constructivist approach predicts better performance with the question types that you hear um, more frequently. And at least in my studies, that's what we seem to find. Children are very good at um, questions that they've heard a lot, like what's that, and much higher error rates. Error rates 50% or higher for some of the question types that they uh, hear more rarely. So that's just one example and, and basically what, we, what I do in my studies is just kind of do this over and over again for different sentence types. So for questions, for passive sentences uh, and also for inflection and morphology. So the, the morphemes, the little markers 
that go on the ends of words. So like in English, you have play, plays, played, or in Russian, igrat, igrayu, igrayesh, igrayetje, and so on. So again, the Chomskyan approach would say, once you've learned the verb and you've learned the morpheme, it's a rule that puts them together. You should be equally good with all verbs and all morphemes, whereas the constructivist approach says, no, you're, you start by learning the whole word form and you should be very good with word forms that you've heard frequently and bad with ones that you've heard much less frequently. A difficult thing about the universal grammar debate is that it means lots of different things to different people, or even lots of different things to the same people at, at different points in, in time. So sometimes when people mean universal grammar, they are talking about the, the things I mentioned before, these very specific things like categories that you're born with and rules for combining them to make sentences. But sometimes people use universal grammar to mean just the ability to learn language. So if you present these arguments to Chomsky and say, you know, the findings of studies like mine and say this means there's no universal grammar, he says, no, that's ridiculous. Universal grammar is what means that a human child can learn language and my cat can't learn language. So by definition, a child has universal grammar. So in, at that level, of course, we can all agree with the idea of universal grammar. The debate over whether there's universal grammar is um, whether we're born with these kind of very specific categories and rules. So whether there can be any conciliation between the two approaches depends on exactly what you mean by universal grammar. If we're talking about very general things like a bias to be interested in sounds, to be interested in other people and what they seem to be trying to convey, or, um, or whatever Chomsky means when he says whatever it is that allows humans to learn language and not cats or trees, then of course we can all agree with the universal grammar. Um, but I can't see any conciliation between approaches that posit that you are born with abstract knowledge of categories or that you aren't. This seems kind of a black and white. Yeah, cross-linguistic studies are a very interesting way of trying to choose between these two approaches. But again, it's difficult to do because you get um, the findings can be interpreted either way. So I'm running studies that are at the moment that are looking at causation, the language of causation across five different languages. So we're doing English, Hebrew, um, Quiche, Japanese and Hindi. And I'm finding there's some real similarities across these different languages in the way causativization works. So English, and I think this, is, this works the same pretty much in Russian as well. So English has basically two different ways of talking about causatives. Um, one is, is just a kind of a straightforward causative like, um, I don't know, the man broke the plate. So the causation is just already there in a kind of straightforward subject, verb, object um, sentence. But we've also got this second type of causation where you have to add the verb make. So you can't say the joke laughed the man, you have to say the joke made the man laugh. And what's interesting is I don't want to say all languages, but a, a lot of languages and all of the languages that I'm studying this project show a very similar pattern. They differ hugely into how they do this, but all of these languages have these two different types of ways of marking cause. And we've got the same 60 actions or the same 60 verbs across all these different languages, and we're looking to see if there are any similarities between the languages in which verbs prefer the, the make type causative and which prefer the other type causative. And what we're finding is there are real similarities here. So you can use the, the performance of English speakers to predict the performance of Hebrew speakers or Quiche Mayan speakers because there's so much similarity across the two languages. So there's different ways you can interpret that. So if you were to come at it from a very Chomskyan perspective, you could say that speakers are born with this knowledge of kind of indirect versus direct causality and the grammatical structures that make that possible. Or if you're coming at it like I am from the other direction, you can say that these are products of linguistic evolution. So speakers of all languages find it important to talk about causes and to distinguish more direct causes from uh, less direct causes. And that's why we've evolved similar grammars. So we can try and answer these questions with cross-linguistic studies, but it always comes back to the same debate. You can always answer you can always interpret the data in these two different ways. So suppose we meet uh, Martians or, or some, some from a different planet, would, how would their language be like ours? So it's, um, I guess, from my perspective at least, it's to do with the extent to which they are similar to us in the things they want to get across. So as I mentioned before with the cross-linguistic studies, the reason that um, English and Quiche and Hebrew all have these two different types of marking cause is that it seems important to us for human speakers um, to be able to discuss causes. So presumably this is because 
you know, if a guy goes around causing people to be dead, then, you know, that's important that we can share that information. So if Martians or these speakers from whatever planet, if they had bodies like ours and, and they could cause injury to each other or they could, um, you know, do good things to each other, then I would expect that they would also have different ways of, um, of marking things like cause or who was doing what to whom in their language. But if they were something like, you know, they were just amorphous gases and they didn't act upon one another, then I would um, think they wouldn't have these types of, um, of ways of talking about cause because it's not relevant to, to their society. Chomsky's latest thinking on this is that language evolved for thought. So that language evolved for humans to process their thoughts internally and the fact that we can use it for communicating with other humans is just a kind of a happy accident, a byproduct of that. Well, I, but I, I would have to say that view is kind of quite controversial even within Chomskyan circles. So Chomsky and some of his co-authors have argued that recently, but not all of the people who follow a Chomskyan um, view would say that. But yeah, certainly for those of us on the other side of the fence, language is all about communication and the reason we have the grammatical structures we do uh, is because it's because it's important for humans to be able to convey these types of meanings. It all goes back to meaning and to pragmatics on our side.